Hello and welcome back to Grammar Development with LFG and XLE. This is the fifth installment. The last time we looked at adjuncts, uh, we learned how to do adjuncts, introduce them in sets. And in particular, we looked at adjectives and adverbs and different types of PPs. And we also looked at how to introduce punctuation and talked a little bit about tokenization. This time, we will look at the integration of optimality marks. Um, this is done within the XLE grammar development platform as a way of disambiguating, of dealing with uh, the amb ambiguity problem that you find in grammar engineering. Um, also, as an additional bonus, so we first introduced OT marks for ambiguity management, but um, it turns out that the way it was implemented with an XLE, it also helps with grammar par parameterization, and you might want to do that if you're uh, parsing different domains or wanting to have a larger or smaller grammar or for different sorts of applications. And we'll also look a little bit at generation and how optimality marks can differ between the parsing direction and the generation direction. And finally, um, just as the last time we had as an added bonus, tokenization and punctuation, we'll do pronouns. And we'll look at pronouns also as a way they'll be used as an example of um, understanding basic steps in grammar engineering. All right, so jumping right in, um, PP ambiguity. In the last exercise, you were asked to implement various types of PPs, and they were fairly complex. And PPs, whether you do LFG or any other type of grammar formalism, they are notorious for causing ambiguities in grammars. So you have um, this example down here. The zookeeper saw the monkey with a telescope. This is known as the PP attachment problem. And the thing is that this sentence has two readings, so either the monkey has the telescope or it's the zookeeper who was looking at the monkey with the telescope. Okay, in one case the PP is attached to the monkey, to the NP, and in the other case the PP is attached at the verb phrase level. Right, so you have at least these two. And we, if you remember from last time, you can have as many PPs as you like, so with each PP that you add, you get more and more ambiguity. So here we have two readings with another PP. We have five readings. I'll show it to you in the, um, in the actual grammar. Uh, with another PP, then you have more, more, even more readings. And in general, this is known as growing exponentially. Um, so it's a challenge to uh, constrain such an ambiguity. Why is it a challenge? Well, um, it's a challenge because some of it you can do in syntax, but a lot of it actually has to do with the lexical semantics of the verb. So what is more likely? Is telescope likely to go with seeing? Or is it, if it were a different sort of verb, if you saw uh, the, if you had something like the zookeeper um, um, ate the monkey with the telescope, then it's not likely that the zookeeper actually used the telescope to eat the monkey, to use that example. Okay, so it's very much verb dependent on which kind, what interpretation you're going to have. And that's difficult to do in syntax without very many lexical um, semantic resources. Sometimes it's also, also world knowledge, um, so it's, that's also very difficult to integrate in a syntax. But you can constrain the ambiguity to some degree, and we have done so in the grammars, and that a way to constrain the ambiguity is done via the OT marks, which, which I will introduce to you as part of this lesson. Okay, so for example, corpus studies have shown that PPs are, um, it's preferred, speakers prefer to, or hearers in this case, prefer to attach PPs locally. Right, so in our example, the zookeeper saw the monkey with a telescope. The preference is to attach the telescope to monkey. Okay, so that you have an NP constituent which embeds a PP constituent. That is the preference. It's not, but it's only a preference, right? So you get context, you get sentences in which this does not happen. But statistically, you can do the corpus studies, and this turns out to be a preference. Uh, not just corpus studies, but also psycholinguistic experiments have shown that this is a preference. So we, can, we would like to integrate this preference into the grammar. It's not a hard and fast rule of the type that we've been writing so far. So far, we've been writing rules that say either this is in or this is out. Okay, either it's grammatical or it's not grammatical. In this case, we want to indicate a preference. And we can do that by harnessing something called optimality theory. 
Optimality theory, or um, also known as OT generally, was invented within theoretical linguistics, in particularly um, with respect to phonology. The uh, names there, if you want to do some more reading, are Alan Prince, uh, Paul Smolensky, um, John McCarthy, and for syntax, Jane Grimshaw, and within LFG in particular, J Joan Bresnan. They've done a lot of work on optimality theory. Um, the new thing about optimality theory was that it saw a grammar as a system of constraints. So not as a system of rules where you say, do this, do that, do that, but as a, as a grammar, of, as a system of constraints, which conspired together to produce well-formed output. Okay. And in classic OT, I don't, again, this, these theoretical constructs, I don't have time to explain them to you in depth. I only explain as much as you need to know for grammar development. Um, but there is a big difference between classical OT as done in theoretical linguistics and the OT that we've come up with in, for XLE, in that classic OT only knows constraints that are dispreferences. So what you have is you say, I prefer, I disprefer a certain situation. I disprefer having a verb at the beginning of a sentence, for example. Okay, so you can only disprefer things. Um, OT is implemented with an XLE in contrast uses both diff dispreference and preference marks. And the preference marks are marked with a plus in front of them. So here's an example. Okay, so plus, some mark, mark there stands for some mark, we can make up a name, and this indicates a preference. And just the name of a OT mark indicates preference. And we'll see more examples of this so that you can understand that better. The main point here is that we use both plus, uh, so preference and dispreference. You can say, no, I don't like this structure. Oh, yes, I prefer this structure. Another difference is, is that classic OT assumes a hierarchy, just a simple hierarchy of constraints. They're all in the same boat. Um, whereas OT as implemented in XLE uses a structured hierarchy, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. Uh, that's, it's hard to explain without an example, but an example will be following. Um, what the effect of this is, is that the strength of preference or dispreference marks can be set variably. So not all OT marks um, will, are treated the same in XLE. You can make some be more important than others. Okay? Um, and, that, and that means that the effect of individual OT marks, <clears throat> they can differ quite markedly. And we'll see some examples of that. OT marks can be added anywhere. You can add them to rules. You can say, I prefer this type of rule over that type of rule. You can add them in the lexicon. You can say, I prefer this lexical item to that other lexical item, or this disjunct within a lexical item in comparison to that other one. And you can add them to templates. Again, you can prefer disjuncts, certain disjuncts in a template. You can prefer templates over other templates. It's um. It's, uh, I won't say it's a science, but it is quite an art to use OT marks well in the XLE grammars. They have a, if you use them well and use them judiciously, they can help with your grammar writing enormously. Okay, so examples. Um, common errors can be dispreferred rather than being completely ruled out. If you remember at the very beginning, I gave you an example of a call grammar where we allowed ungrammatical input in, but generated only grammatical input, uh, grammatical output. Here's an example of that, how that works. So here's subject verb agreement. What we have is a template that says, I need my subject's person to be three, my subject's number to be singular. And then we've added a disjunct. We've said, or we'll add an OT mark called bad v agar, bad verb agreement. And what the effect of this template now is that it either allows for normal verb agreement, subject verb agreement, but it also will allow ungrammatical sentences without good verb agreement, but it'll mark those. And if you remember the call grammar, all those bad examples were marked as being ungrammatical. That's the effect of this OT mark here. Okay, so that's one example for what you can use it. You can say, okay, let through the real grammar, let through the grammatical stuff, but in addition, I'll give you an option to parse ungrammatical input, but I'll mark it as being ungrammatical or dispreferred. Okay, 
Um, another way of using these OT marks is to disprefer parses of ungrammatical structure. So you can um, rank rules, you can write rules that parse bad input. You want to do that sometimes because your grammar needs to be robust if you're doing applications. Um, but you can prefer the better parses, right? So you can say, okay, I'm going, only going to parse ungrammatical input if it's really necessary. And if not, then I prefer to have grammatical input. And what ends up happening is a two plus pass system. So what XLE ends up doing is it tries to optimize um, the parses that it gives you. So it tries to find only the best ones. If it can't find the best parse for a certain thing, it'll start looking for dispreferred parses and it'll then produce those. And you can iterate that as much as you want, in fact. And we'll see some, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in some of the next slides. Okay, OT marks are projected to a separate projection, the O structure, and it is, um, I've given you in brackets there, this O colon colon. That's the actual way of referring to a level of projection within LFG, within XLE. Um, the up and equal, up and down arrows we've been using, those are shortcuts for F structure. The um, down arrow is actually if you really were serious about notation, it would be F colon colon, saying this is the F structure. Um, you can read more about that than the grammatical notations, but you'll see this O colon colon in the, um, in the output that we'll produce with the XLE, so that's why I'm telling you about that here. Um, the O structure is not structured, even though it's called O structure, O projection. Um, all you do, all you get in the O structure is a bunch of OT marks. They're just collected in there, so you can think of it as a bag. It's basically a big set. So what the grammar does is it goes through all the parses, and as it is parsing things, it, as it encounters OT marks, it collects them, puts them in a bag, and then counts what kinds of OT marks have been encountered, whether preference, dispreference, and how many of them, um, and then figures out the best parses and only presents those. We'll see that in a bit. So uh, what you see there illustrated here is that we have some OT mark, some name, and here's the dollar sign, okay? That means put it in a set. It's an element of a set of the O projection. That's this thing here, okay? That's how it works. And that's what we'll see in the grammar. Okay, how do we specify this optimality order? So the order of the constraints that we're putting in, the OT marks, are part of the grammar header. It's part of the configuration section of your grammar. It can be modified um, for grammar customization. So as you're saying, okay, I want my grammar to be able to parse these things, but not those things. Um, you can modify that part of the header. The optimality order in the configuration section is for parsing, and then there's another option called gen optimality order, and that's for generation. Okay, so you can have two different types of constraints, OT marks, one for the parsing direction, one for the generation direction. And you want this because you want to be able to, for example, with a call grammar, you want to be able to parse all kinds of input, but you only want to be able to generate correct input, mostly, uh, correct output. Okay, so you can't use the same types of constraints. Um, another point, OT marks can be organized into groups of equal rank via these round brackets. So what we've got here is exam an example. So this is the optimality order configuration specification. That's part of your grammar, your configuration section. And I've got here dispreferr mark one, preference mark one, dispreference mark two, and then some more marks, three and four, and these are grouped as being of the same sort, okay? Whereas these other ones, and I'll go through example now, what you generally do is you start at the left. This is the most serious dispreference mark. This is the most effective preference mark. This is the next serious dispreference mark. And then these two are ranked equally. So let's look at an um, um, uh, abstract example of this. And we'll see a concrete example in the grammar in a little bit, so bear with me here. <clears throat> so 
So what you do if you have an example like that down here, optimality order, dis preference mark one, preference mark one, dis preference mark two, what the grammar does, it starts with the leftmost OT mark, that's this one, dis preference mark one. And then what it does, it goes through all the parses it has, and it keeps all the parses with the fewest instances of dis, dis preference mark one. All the other ones, if it's gone through all the rules of the grammar and it's encountered <coughs> rules or lexical entries or templates that triggered the dis preference mark one, it'll consider those suboptimal and put them aside. Among the remaining parses, it'll keep those with the most in instances of preference mark one, okay, because this is being preferred. So it goes around the grammar, it collects up all the rules, lexical entries, templates, Wherever it's triggered preference mark one, it says, oh, this is a good thing. And I'll consider all the others that are not marked positively as suboptimal. So it puts those aside as well. Okay. So the bigger your grammars get, the more ambiguity you'll have. So you often get a case, especially with long sentences, 40, 50 words, that you get about 200, 300 parses. So imagine that in the first instance, you've been able to throw out 100. In the second instance, you've been able to throw out another 50. <clears throat> so now you're left with another 150 or something. Among these remaining parses, keep those with the fewest instances of dispreference mark 2. Okay, so now dispreference mark 2 is kicking in. If you find any of that marked with that mark, put them aside, consider them to be suboptimal, and keep working with the rest. So maybe now we're down to 20 or so, and then we can maybe use the other marks that we had before. Okay? So what you do, the grammar goes through them one by one by one, puts aside that are marked as dispreferred, um, prefers those that are marked as being um, plus with a plus mark, etc. And so slowly, slowly winnows out more and more of the ambiguous parses, and keeps as little as possible. Your ultimate goal should be to have at least to have only one parse. For short sentences, this is easy to achieve. For longer ones, they tend to be ambiguous, but it would be good if you're if you have a very, very low number. So potential applications. Um, one of the things that we will see in the grammar right now <clears throat> is to prefer oblique interpretations of PPs over adjunct interpretations. This again, you can look at corpus studies, etc. This makes sense. So if you have something like the zookeeper waited for the gorilla, okay, wait for is um, wait in this instance is a verb which is taking a certain kind of oblique for the gorilla. For is not uh, any kind of spatial preposition, etc. So in this case, you really want the oblique interpretation. You could also have an adjunct interpretation in principle, but you would prefer to have the oblique one. And in general, the oblique case is the specialized case. So when that case is possible, you should prefer that rather than the other, the more general case. Because generally you have some specification in the grammar that says this can be an oblique reading in this case. And then if you have that, you should prefer it. So that is one thing you can do. Another thing you can do <coughs> is you can prefer ditransitive subcat frames over transitive ones. Okay, and again, the reason is the same. If you have a ditransitive specification, if you have a verb that takes three arguments, it tends to be a more specialized case than transitive ones. So if you have that possibility, generally you should go for the more specialized one. So the example here, the girl gave her brother money. Um, it's the girl who gives to her brother some money. Okay, so three arguments. But the grammar, if you have a possibility in there, you might also get a sense in which you have the girl gave her brother money. So, no, I didn't say that right. The, um, there is a sense in which there might be some concept called brother money. Okay, there's some money that's brother money. And in that case, you get only two arguments. And if you, for some reason, have a verb, give is here not maybe the best one, but you, you have verbs which are ambiguous between transitives and ditransitives, if you have a ditransitive, if you have a transitive possibility, the grammar will also spit that one out. But you would want to legislate against that, and you can do that via OT marks. Okay, 
Uh, and then you can prefer grammatical constructions, but also allow ungrammatical ones like the subject verb agreement that we just had for call applications. So let's look at this in some, um, in a practical way. This was all very abstract so far, so let's look at it in a more practical way. So we'll leave the slides and go to the, um, to the grammar. So I'll call up my grammar. This is now grammar four. And I'll make that bigger again. Okay, and I'll go in here and start a new XLE process. Okay, and then I have to create my parser. I'm going to work with grammar four. And everything is working here. And I'll split my window and get my test suite. Test suite four, so I can see what I was going to illustrate. Okay, so we're going to start with this part. Actually, we're going to not parse yet. I'm going to show you the grammar. I'll make that bigger too. Okay, so here's the grammar. And I'll go through as I have been doing it the last few times, telling you what's new. This is your configuration section, and what's new in this case here is the optimality order and the gen optimality order. Okay, these have been added to your configuration section. In the optimality order, you have gotten, you have two OT marks that I've already put in, PP edge and plus PP attach. So this is a dis preference mark, the PP edge, and the plus PP attach is a preference mark, just to show you how to do each. There's this no good in here. Um, that will I'll explain that in a minute. It's a way of par parameterizing grammars. Any OT marks to the left of this have the effect that rules, lexical entries, templates marked with that in a first parse, or no, in general, are not considered to be are are discarded by the by the XLE completely. It's so it's a way of parameterizing your grammar. You can have a mark. And if you say, okay, now I'm going to be using or be using my grammar for an application where certain things need to be able not to work or they do need to be able to work, you can just move the mark, the OT mark, from here to over there. So it's one simple change and then suddenly all the rules that you've marked with that are no longer uh, being used by the, by the grammar. So it's a very, very simple change rather than copying, pasting, commenting out 10 rules. You can mark 10 rules with this one OT mark, and then suddenly they won't be used anymore by the grammar. If you want them back, you put them back to the right of no good. Okay, so let's see what else is in our grammar. We have our morphology. We're still using our parser, parsing and generation tokenizers. We have our S rule that has not changed. The VP rule has changed somewhat in that I have added an OT mark to the PP. This is the PP rule for adjuncts. And I've added an OT mark PP adjunct, PP edge. And this will disprefer adjunct PPs. Remember I showed you that example where you want to prefer obols. This will actually, you can either write one in here and say I prefer obliques, or you can disprefer adjuncts in general. And what I've chosen to do here is I've chosen to disprefer adjuncts. And we'll see the effect of that in a minute. Let's move on to the NP rule. This is um, this NP rule now has adjectives added to it, an AP, an adjective phrase, which expands to something which allows one, a zero, or as many as you want adverbs, infinitely many adverbs, followed by an adjective, followed by an optional comma. This is part of what you were um, asked to do in the last exercise. Okay, in the NP rule, so we have the adjective phrase, the noun, the head of the NP. We have PPs, you were asked to add this too. So now you have prepositional phrases modifying a noun phrase. They're adjuncts. And what I've done here is I've gotten an OT mark over here. 
which says OT mark PP attach. And what the effect of this is, remember up there, PP attach was a positive one. It prefers and it prefers prepositional phrases that are that occur within noun phrases. Okay, so prepositional phrases occurring within noun phrases are preferred. That should be the effect of that. Okay, now let's look at this. The PP um, rule is the same as before. We allow for semantic and non-semantic PPs. That's quite complicated, but that's the way it is. In the templates, here is a new template, OT mark. Okay, and what this template basically does is it says, give me a value, and that value, underscore mark, will become an element of the O projection. That's what I said before, it just, they just get collected up in this projection. There's an underscore here. What this means, the underscore means in Excel is that it's an instantiated variable. And that means there should be only, it cannot be unified with other kinds of um, uh, features for this. Okay, so it can only occur once. It's to try to make sure that if you really want to specify something as being unique, that it stays unique. So it's not going to be subject to unification. Right, so let's move on. We know passive, we know date of shift, we have all these subcategorization templates. There's nothing new here. I have added a template for prepositions, and this will go for most prepositions where you either have the version with a predicate and an object, or a version with just a p-form. Okay, the lexicon is the nouns are not anything new, neither are the verbs. I might have introduced a few more verbs, but that's it. In the entry for weighted, I have added a constraint that says, in this case, it should be on for weighted on. Okay. Um, adjectives are here. I've added some adverbs. All they do is just add a predicate. And we have some prepositions. And that is it. The rest should be familiar to you. I haven't actually added a comma. I need to do that. Okay, so let's look at um, some of the examples. So what I'm going to do first, I've added the OT marks in already, but I'm going to comment them out for the moment so we can see what the grammar looks like without the OT marks. Okay. And that's, where's the other one? Here. So I'm just going to comment them out. And then I'm going to, I have to reload my grammar with control up arrow. I can get that again. Okay, so let's try this example. The dog saw the gorilla with a telescope, escape control P. And I get two trees. Let's look at them. One is the PP is attached at the VP level, so this is the reading where the dog has the telescope. And let's see, there's the F structure for it, so dog is up here, subject, gorilla object, and we have with a telescope being analyzed as an adjunct, okay, as a semantic type of adjunct. Now let's look at the other reading. Uh, next, C structure 2. Oops, let's make that a bit bigger. What we see here is that the PP now is within the NP constituent, okay? So if you remember previously, they were sisters, NP and PP. In this C structure, the PP has been embedded within the NP. And the F structure that corresponds to that is an object which is modified by an adjunct, which, is, which contains with a telescope. Okay, you saw this in the walkthrough, but I'll show it to you again. These windows at the right now, they come into play when you have more than one solution. So what you have here, this is the F chart window. 
you can click on these things. These are live buttons, A1 and A2. So we have basically two readings. This window shows you the same information, just in a different way. It says there's two readings, A1 and A2, and you can click on these. I can click on A1, I get the other one. And this bit is a bit hard to read, but it's easier to read here. So A1, the red one, is the active one, is the reading in which with the telescope is an adjunct of the clause. If I click on that one, we get the corresponding trees and F structures. This is the reading in which with the telescope is modifying gorilla. Okay, so if you start becoming, if you start having multiple um, parses for things and you're trying to understand how these relate to one another, these windows start coming in. You can click on these live buttons, these active buttons, and get the different ones. Essentially what this is here, this is a packed representation of two F structures. Okay, so what this is is both analyses in one and you can unpack them by looking at the individual F structures. And you can read about packed representations more in the XLE documentation. Right, so we've got two readings for that. So then let's go back to the grammar. So that's just with one PP. Let's try it with two PPs. Now we have, it says up there, five valid trees. Okay, and we can try to understand what these trees are. We can click through them. One is the gorilla, no, so the dog has the telescope and the telescope is in the garden. Next one the gorilla, the dog has the telescope, and the dog is in the garden. And the next one, um, the gorilla now has the telescope, the dog is in the garden, the PP is at the BP level. Fourth structure, um, it's the gorilla who has the telescope and the gorilla is in the garden. And then the fifth structure where it's the gorilla who has the telescope and the telescope is in the garden. So you can worry about whether these all make sense, but with the rules that you've written, you've got all these possibilities. You've got five possibilities now. And again, you can look at these in your FS chart. This is the packed representation of all five possibilities. And you can click on that, click on the various possibilities. Okay, so you can see that the adjunct can be here at the top level or it can be with a gorilla and then you have various possibilities down there. I'm not going to go through all them in detail. All I want to do is show you how these indeed um, grow. So let's take one with three in the telescope, with a telescope in the garden by a tree. And now we have 14 valid trees. Okay, I'm not going to go through them all, but here you've got all 14 possibilities packed into one F chart. Um, I'll leave it as an exercise. You can go through these, through these yourselves and try to understand all of them. But the point is you don't really want 14 sentences like this. You don't really want 14 parses. You would like something a little bit less. So what we can do is we can see what we can put our OT mark back in and we can see how that works. So we will say, okay, I want to prefer PPs attached to NPs. Okay, this is what we're saying here. We're saying, I prefer the version in which the PP is attached to the NP. So let's try that. So I've made my change. I need to reload my grammar. Control up arrow, and then I'll reparse this thing, this sentence. And indeed, I only have one parse left, and it's the parse in which the gorilla has the telescope. Okay, so there's one parse. But if you look at the um, the output of XLE over here, it says I have one plus one solutions. This plus one solution that you see there. 
that indicates that there is another solution, but it's been considered to be unoptimal. So we can, if we're interested in understanding what that is, we can press this button. This is the O projection. And another window pops up, the O structure window. And it says, yes, there is another, um, there was another parse. It was set aside as being suboptimal because it triggered the dispreference mark PP attach. Now, if we're really interested in understanding what this is, we can actually get, um, how does that work? We can get, we can try to get that mark. Um, I didn't try this out before for some reason. Nope. Um, command. Values. There's a way of um, seeing the unoptimal ones, but I'll have to show you that next time because I didn't check on this. Maybe we can just do next. Yep. Nope. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is actually the other one. Okay, so um, they have been put aside. You cannot see them. Um, there is actually a way of, of seeing them, but for now I don't see how that works. So um, let's move on to the next one, to the next sentence. The dog saw the gorilla with the telescope in the garden. What you've got here now, remember we had five for these. For this one now we just have two. Okay, there's one gorilla with a telescope in the garden. It's all within the NP. That's what we prefer. And then there's another one in which, again, both of these are attached to the NP, but it's a different NP that is being attached to. So the grammar can't tell which one we prefer. It says, okay, both of them trigger the um, preference mark, saying I prefer having it attached to an NP, and that's what's happening here. Okay. And again, we can see with the OT mark, let's get rid of all of these again, um, that there's two marks that were found, PP attach, PP attach, okay? And each of these readings has the same two marks. Okay, so there were two, it was triggered twice, and we have two readings with exactly these two OT marks, so the grammar can't decide between them. So that is what we can, um, so it gives you both of those. So you still have some ambiguity. Okay, so the last one, remember for that one, we had how many? 14, let's see how many we get now. 14, now we have, we're down to five. So that's already better, okay? Five is a lot better than 14. Via these OT marks again, we can see that there were some, um, uh, some other um, parses that triggered these OT marks. Now let's try a different example. Ad adjunct versus oblique PPs. The bone was devoured by the dog. Okay, so we have two valid trees, it says up there. The bone was devoured by the dog, PP. This is a reading in which there's an adjunct, so by the dog is an adjunct. We have a null subject, it's passive, and by the dog is being treated as an adjunct. That was one of the possibilities we allow in the passive lexical rule. Other version looks exactly the same with the C structure. At the F structure level, we have an oblique agent here. Okay, by the dog is being considered an oblique agent. So what we can do is we can put back in our rule, our OT mark that I'd already prepared, the OT mark that said disprefer adjuncts. Let's put that back in. Okay, then let's reload the grammar and now try that same one again. 
Okay, now we have just one valid tree. And which reading are we getting? Well, we're getting the reading which has the oblique agent. So the other reading has now disappeared. Okay. And we can see that the other reading, sorry, um, the other reading triggered um, uh, OT constraint PP adjunct, right? And it's a minus. So it triggered, um, it triggered a dispreference constraint. Uh, okay, so here, actually, I got it now. So if I want to see the other one, I can ask for under views, I can ask for the unoptimal view, the unoptimal one, and then I get both back in. Okay, now we can see both of those back here. So we have two possibilities shown in the FS chart. One is where we have it as an adjunct and one where we had it, have it as an oblique agent. Okay, I'll do that again. I'll parse this thing. Uh, got my window. Let's reparse it. Okay, I'll kill this for now. Let's reparse again. Okay, so I have one tree instead of the two, one F structure, it's just the oblique agent. But if I click on the OT mark box, I get the information that there's actually one plus one solution and that a dispreference mark was triggered. And so this other solution was put aside as suboptimal. And then under views, if I click on that, I can check this box unoptimal or I can just type U that's what that means in the angle brackets there and then it gives me that suboptimal one back so the suboptimal solutions have not been put away entirely by the grammar they have just been suppressed as being suboptimal okay and if I want to see them again then I get them again this is useful for some things if you're trying to understand grammar if you're trying to do some grammar debugging etc Okay, but on the whole now, what we've seen is that with just two OT marks, I've managed to constrain the grammar ambiguity that was um, introduced to the, in the grammar through these, PP, uh, through these various different types of prepositional phrases. I've been able to constrain the ambiguity there by quite a lot, and I could add in more OT marks as needed. Okay, now let's go back to the presentation, and I'll come back to the grammar in a little bit. Uh, but let's go back to the presentation for now and move on a little bit. So just to finish off the OT marks, um, here's some things you can do, some extra things. What I've shown you in the grammar is very, very basic. Um, you've seen order of marks. I've explained that to you already. You can have preference marks, dispreference marks. We've seen uh, no good already in the optimality order within the grammar. And what that does, again, marks to the left of no good, marks to the left of no good are always bad. So what happens if you have a mark there, the grammar decides to discard that analysis entirely. So not like what we just saw it being suboptimal, it just says this analysis did not exist and throws it away completely. And that's useful for parameterizing grammar with respect to certain domains. So if you have, if you know that you're going to, <clears throat> to be doing a certain domain where certain funny constructions happen, um, you write certain rules just for that domain. You don't want those rules interfering with your grammar all the time. You can mark them with an OT mark and for most of your normal parsing, you can just ignore those rules. If you're having to deal with a specialized domain, then you can put them back in just by moving, for example, this mark four over the no good to over here. Then suddenly all those rules will be in the grammar again. Okay, a different version of this whole thing is the stop point mark. There you can slowly increase the search space of the grammar. So what you do is you first say, okay, I'm going to try a good, I'm going to try to find a parse for the sentence using these, using mark one. Okay, just using dispreferences there. Um, this is a way of making your grammar more efficient. So rather than trying all the rules all at once, the grammar will preferentially only look for those rules. 
Then if it can't find a good parse, it'll go back here and it'll try this one. It'll say, okay, I'll consider all the ones, all the rules that have been marked with this one. If it still can't find one, it'll go beyond this stop point and try all of those. Okay, so you can have this way you can implement a multi-pass grammar. The effect, the overall effect of this is to make your grammar more efficient. It doesn't have to consider all the rules all at once. It can consider the rules first that are most likely, that'll trigger a lot. And then if you really have a specialized construction, that will take a longer time to parse, but all the ones that are very normal constructions will be, much, will be parsed much more efficiently. You can read about this and there's several other more special OT marks um, that XLE allows you to use. You can read about that in the XLE documentation and in the exercise I point you to words exactly where that is. Okay, so this actually says exactly what I just said right now. I'll repeat it again though because it's important. If a lexicon entry or a rule projects an OT mark that is listed to the left of no good, that part of the grammar is deactivated. That lexical entry is deactivated, that rule is deactivated, or the template. This can be used for expensive constructions, what I just said, rare constructions, or really rare readings of particular lexical items. You need to have them in, but you know they hardly ever occur, or you know you have an application where this doesn't occur, then you can use that. So the effect is grammar param parameterization. Stop points intended for better performance. They need to be used cautiously. And if you've marked something with a stop point OT mark, if you've put an OT mark to the left of a stop point, it's not used in the first parsing attempt. It's used in the second attempt and you can have multiple stop points, okay? Okay, now let's move on to generation. As you know, XLE can generate strings from well-formed f-structures. If the f-structures are not well-formed, if they're disconnected, it can't do it, but it can generate. The gen optimality order can be different from the optimality order. And in the Pargram grammars, these orders generally differ. So the types of OT marks you want for generation usually differ. And this is comparable to the situation with transducers where the generation tokenizer is more restrictive than the parsing tokenizer. Um, the usual example is you might want to, people have typed three white spaces instead of one, you want to be able to parse that, but you don't want to generate that out, or three commas instead of one, etc. Okay. So, um, how do we generate with XLE? I've shown you this already a little bit, but now I'll, I'll tell you again explicitly. There's two ways. You either go to the commands menu of your f-structure window and say generate from this fs, ff stands for f-structure, or at the xle command line you type in regenerate the sentence to be parsed. So you can do either. And then let's look at this in the grammar. Okay, so we move back to the, um, the grammar. So let's try this. I'm going to parse this. The dog devours the bone. Okay. And it has just one solution. That's okay. It's a normal transitive sentence. What I can do is I can go here, click on commands, and then say generate from this F structure. And it does that. I go back to my window. I showed you this already. It's very unspectacular, but it actually shows you this and it gives you the sentence back. And it shows you that actually there's four possibilities. You can have either the spelt with a small t or with a capital T. And you can have bone without a full stop or with a full stop. Okay, and that's how we've specified the grammar. The full stop is optional in our grammar. If you remember, we'll go to that part. See here, we have an optional period, an optional full stop. So when the grammar is generating, it goes through and says, okay, well, I can have a full stop or not. So it gives you both possibilities. And we still have a full form lexicon. We will get rid of, we'll change that soon. But right now we still have a full form lexicon and I've given you the and the, okay. Um, so the grammar says, well, you know, it could be either uh, small t or capitalized T. At the beginning of the sentence, you notice it doesn't give you this option. That's because we've got a tokenizer in there for the generation direction that says at the beginning of a sentence, this needs to be capitalized. It's already smart enough to know that. 
But to deal with this problem and the punctuation problem, we'll have to adjust the grammar in some way. Okay. Uh, we'll try this one. This one doesn't have a full stop. And it doesn't have a capital V at the beginning. Let's see what happens there. It gives you, in fact, the same... Uh, hang on, I have to regenerate. Generate from this F structure. Did it do it? No. Nope. Oh, there it is. Um, I did it twice because I clicked twice. So it gives you actually exactly the same possibility as you had before, even though the input was different. I had a didn't capitalize the the and I didn't have a full stop here, but it gives you exactly the same output as before for the other sentence because it's gone through the grammar. It's, it's not working off this sentence. It's not working off the surface string. It's working off the F structure and the F structure is the same. And it goes through the grammar and it says, give me the string for this F structure. And then the possible strings are exactly the same ones because our full stop is still optional and we still have the, um, with capital letters and without. Okay, now we could think about how to actually improve this. Um, I won't do anything about it here. I just wanted to illustrate to you that, in fact, the parsing and the generation um, ways are different. And I wanted to show you how to work with a generator. So the other option is to say something like regenerate the dog appears. Let's try a different example. So regenerate the dog appears. And it'll do that right there. That's, um, if you're just trying to test the generator, that's an easier way than parsing, going through the F-structure, and then saying generate from this F-structure. Sometimes you want to see the F-structure first, sometimes you just want to see what the generator will produce, then you can use this command, regenerate the dog appears, or whatever sentence you want to par uh, regenerate there. Okay, And here's the output. Again, um, you can have it either with a full stop or without. Okay, that concludes what I need to do with the grammar. So we're going to go back to this. So I've shown you a bit of generation. It'll keep coming up. And I want to switch um, for the end of this session. I want to switch to a different topic. I want to do pronouns. We've been using full NPs in all of the examples. But it would be nice to use pronouns as well, so things like I or she or he. So let's look at how that would work, how we could integrate that into the grammar. And um, I'll use this problem of doing pronouns, it's not a very difficult problem, um, just to illustrate the basic typical steps involved in grammar engineering as well. So what should the F structure be? That's the first question you should ask yourself. I'm going to try to integrate pronouns. What should my F-structure representation look like? Well, and then the second question you should ask yourself, or both at the same time, what should the C-structure be? Okay, what should my analysis be? So here, if you're not a linguist, you should go ask a linguist, consult some grammar books, do something, um, but figure out what your analysis is. After you figured out what your analysis is going to be, then you should implement the rules along with functional annotations. The lexical entries with part of speech category and functional information, and you should add templates where appropriate. Now I'm putting this here very explicitly because I found in teaching this course that people forget to do one or the other. They write in their lexical entries, then they're surprised if it doesn't parse because they haven't actually added any rules, any C structure rules to parse this type of thing. Okay? Or they've forgotten they add something in the C structure rules and they call a pronoun, a pronoun, a P or a per, and then in the lexical entry they call it a pron, and then they are surprised when the C structure rules can't pick up on pron. So remember that you need to think about both the C structure, the context-free rules that span the words of the sentence, and the F structure, so the annotations to produce the correct functional information. Both of those things need to be done, and they need to be done at, both at the same time. Okay, otherwise it won't work. So, let's see. For English, what pronouns are used in the language? English is fairly easy. There's only a few and there's not very much morphology. Here's some basic personal pronouns. I, me, we, us, you, she, he, it, her, him, they, them. 
So we can look at those and we can say, okay, what are they encoding? Well, number, clearly, I versus we. I is singular, plural is we. Gender, in some cases, she versus he versus it. Her, him. Okay, not in all cases, but in some. Case. Nominative she versus accusative her, for example. Person. Should. Pronoun should encode person. First person versus second person. So I versus you. Okay, so those things at least. And then once you've determined that, you could also try to figure out, or you should figure out, what else you need from a grammar engineering perspective. Okay, so these are the things the linguists will care about. What else might one need? So either you've already, you've already become advanced enough in your grammar to realize what kinds of things you need, what kinds of standards you have. You can always look at the PARGRAM guidelines as well. The other thing you can do is you can look for existing work, so either the PARGRAM cookbook, or you can actually go look up an actual grammar. And a very good place to look is the English PARGRAM grammar. Um, or if there's grammars existing that are more closely related to your languages than English, then look at those. But the English PARGRAM grammar is fairly comprehensive. It's available over the Ines Exley web interface. So you can go there, you can type in a sentence, and you can say, oh, okay, so what does this look like? And then you can think about what you would like for your analysis. So this is what um, the English Pargram Grammar gives, gives for a typical pronoun. She appeared. Okay, so we have pred she, this is a subject. And then we can look at, we can inspect that, what they do for a pronoun. They have as a pred she. This is different from what theoretical LFG will do. Um, in theoretical LFG you have pred pro to indicate pro meaning it stands for some pronoun. From a grammar engineering perspective, we've found that um, having the actual form in there is much more useful for further semantic processing. So this is what the grammar, English grammar does. Then we have something called n-type, n-syntax, pronoun. We found this to be useful information as well. You could decide whether to implement that or not. Case nominative, you want that. Gen sem female, the gender. This is how they encoded gender. Human plus was considered to be important for the English grammar. It's important for relative clause, for relative clauses actually. You can decide whether to have that in there or not. Number singular, you would definitely need that. Third person, definitely need that. And then pron type purse. We found that usually it's very, very helpful to have to just say what kind of pronoun type it is. This is a personal pronoun as opposed to a possessive pronoun or a reflexive pronoun. Okay, so you can look at those and think about, okay, do I want that feature? Do I not want that feature? Which feature do I really need? And take that as an inspiration. Um, so, okay, so that's the S structure. So now let's look at C structure. Pronouns, of course, substitute for NPs. So what you need to do, <clears throat> if you think about your grammar, you need to implement a disjunction in the NP rule. And I've given you a simplified version here. So first of all, NP either... Right, you're making disjunct. This is what you've got before. Determiner, optional determiner, followed by an AP, followed by a noun, a noun, followed by PPs, or a pronoun. So either that whole stuff here, or just a pronoun. Okay, so you need to have that kind of a disjunct. Then you need to add pronouns to your lexicon with the right part of speech. You've decided to call it pron here. You need to call it exactly that in the lexical entry. That's what I've done here. Okay. And then one or more elegant templates. I've just got one here. And then you can decide what that should look like. But that's the kind of information that needs to be in there at the very least. Okay, and this concludes lesson five. In the practical exercise that you will be asked to do, um, it's an exercise five, and you will practice with pronouns, so you should integrate pronouns into your grammar. Um, constraining PP ambiguity by using OT marks. So I already gave you some examples, but there's much more work to be done. And then experimenting a little bit with generation, just getting used to how generation looks like and thinking about how one could constrain that as well. Okay, and that concludes this session.